War and Peace, Book One, Chapter Fourteen, read for LibriVox.org by Chip in Tampa, Florida. After receiving her visitors, the countess was so tired that she gave orders to admit no more. But the porter was told to be sure to invite to dinner all those who came to congratulate. The countess wished to have a tete-a-tete -tete talk with the friend of her childhood, Princess Anna Mikhailovna whom she had not seen properly since she returned from Petersburg. Anya Mikhailovna, with her tear-worn but pleasant face, drew her chair nearer to that of the countess. "'With you I will be quite frank,' said Anya Mikhailovna. "'There are not many left of us old friends. That's why I so value your friendship.' Anya Mikhailovna looked at Vera and paused. The countess pressed her friend's hand. "'Vera?' she said to her eldest daughter, who was evidently not a favorite. "'How is it that you have so little tact? Don't you see you are not wanted here? Go to the other girls, or—' The handsome Vera smiled contemptuously, but did not seem at all hurt. "'If you had told me sooner, Mamma, I should have gone,' she replied, as she rose up to go to her own room. But as she passed the sitting-room she noticed two couples sitting, one pair at each window. She stopped and smiled scornfully. Sonya was sitting close to Nicholas, who was copying out some verses for her, the first he had ever written. Boris and Natasha were at the other window, and ceased talking when Vera entered. Sonya and Natasha looked at Vera with guilty, happy faces. It was pleasant and touching to see these little girls in love, but apparently the sight of them roused no pleasant feeling in Vera. "'How often have I asked you not to take my thing?' she said. "'You have a room of your own,' and she took the inkstand from Nicholas. "'In a minute, in a minute,' he said, dipping his pen. "'You always manage to do things at the wrong time,' continued Vera. "'You came rushing into the drawing-room so that everyone felt ashamed of you.' Though what she said was quite just, perhaps for that very reason, no one replied, and the four simply looked at one another. She lingered in the room with the inkstand in her hand. "'And at your age what secrets can there be between Natasha and Boris, or between you two? It's all nonsense.' "'Now, Vera, what does it matter to you?' said Natasha in defense, speaking very gently. She seemed that day to be more than ever kind and affectionate to everyone. "'Very silly,' said Vera. "'I am ashamed of you. Secrets, indeed.' "'All have secrets of their own,' answered Natasha, getting warmer. "'We don't interfere with you and Berg.' "'I should think not,' said Vera, "'because there can never be anything wrong in my behavior. But I'll just tell Mamma how you are behaving with Boris. Natalia Lichnia behaves very well to me.' remarked Boris. I have nothing to complain of. Don't, Boris, you are such a diplomat, and it is really tiresome, said Natasha, with a mortified voice that trembled slightly. She used the word diplomat, which was just then very much in vogue among the children, in the special sense they attached to it. Why does she bother me? And she added, turning to Vera, you'll never understand it, because you've never loved any one. You have no heart. You are a Madame de Gelness, and nothing more. This nickname, bestowed on Vera by Nicholas, was considered very stinging. "'And your greatest pleasure is to be so unpleasant to people. Go and flirt with Berg as much as you please,' she finished quickly. "'I shall, at any rate, not run after a young man before visitors.' "'Well, now you've done what you wanted,' put in Nicholas. "'Said unpleasant things to everyone and upset them. Let's go to the nursery.' All four, like a flock of scared birds, got up and left the room. "'The unpleasant things were said to me,' remarked Vera. "'I said none to any one. "'Madame de Gelness! Madame de Gelness! shouted laughing voices through the door. The handsome Vera, who produced such an irritating and unpleasant effect on everyone, smiled, and, evidently unmoved by what had been said to her, went to the looking-glass and arranged her hair and scarf. Looking at her own handsome face, she seemed to become still colder and calmer. In the drawing-room the conversation was still going on. "'Ah, my dear,' said the Countess, "'my life is not all roses either. Don't I know that at the rate we are living our means won't last long? It's all the club and is easing-going nature. 
Even in the country do we get any rest, theatricals, hunting, and heaven knows what besides. But don't let's talk about me. Tell me how you managed everything. I often wonder at you, Annette, how at your age you can rush off alone in a carriage to Moscow, to Petersburg, to those ministers and great people, and know how to deal with them all. It's quite astonishing. How did you get your things so settled? I couldn't possibly do it. Ah, my love, answered Anya Mikhailovna. God grant you never know what it is like to be left a widow without means and with a son you love to distraction. One learns many things, then, she added with a certain pride. That lawsuit taught me much. When I went to see one of those big people, I write a note. Princess so-and-so desires an interview with so-and-so, and then I take a cab and go myself, two, three, and four times till I get what I want. I don't mind what they think of me. Well— "'And to whom did you apply about Bory?' asked the Countess. "'You see, yours is already an officer in the guards, "'while my Nicholas is going as a cadet. "'There's no one to interest himself for him. "'To whom did you apply?' "'To Prince Vasily. He was so kind. "'He at once agreed to everything and put the matter before the Emperor,' "'said Princess Anya Mikhailovna enthusiastically, "'quite forgetting all the humiliation she had endured to gain her end.' "'Has Prince Vasily aged much?' asked the Countess. "'I have not seen him since we acted together at the Rumyantsov's theatricals. "'I expect he's forgotten me. "'He paid me attentions in those days,' said the Countess with a smile. "'He is just about the same as ever,' replied Anna Mikhailovna. "'Overflowing with amiability. "'His position has not turned his head at all. "'He said to me, "'I am sorry I could do so little for you, my dear Princess. "'I am at your command.' Yes, he is a fine fellow, and a very kind relation, but naturally, you know my love for my son. I would do anything for his happiness, and my affairs are in such a bad way that my position is now a terrible one, continued Anya Mikhailovna sadly, dropping her voice. My wretched lawsuit takes all I have and makes no progress. Would you believe it? I have literally not a penny, and don't know how to equip Boris. She took out her handkerchief and began to cry. I need five hundred roubles, and have only one twenty-five rouble note. I'm in such a state. My only hope now is in Count Cyril Vladimirovich Bezukhov. If he will not assist his godson, you know he is Bory's godfather, and allow him something for his maintenance, all my trouble will have been thrown away. I shall not be able to equip him. The countess's eyes filled with tears as she pondered in silence. "'I often think, though perhaps it's a sin,' said the princess, "'that here lives Count Cyril Vladimirovich Bezukhov, "'so rich and all alone, that tremendous fortune. "'And what's his life worth? "'It's a burden to him. "'And Boris's life is only just beginning.' "'Surely he will leave something to Boris,' said the countess. "'Heaven only knows, my dear. "'These rich grand days are so selfish.' Still, I will take Boris and go to see him at once, and I shall speak to him straight out. Let people think what they will of me. It's really all the same to me when my son's fate is at stake. The princess rose. It's now two o'clock, and you dine at four. There will be just time. And, like the practical Petersburg lady who knows how to make the most of time, Anya Mikhailovna sent someone to call her son and went into the anteroom with him. "'Good-bye, my dear,' said she to the countess, who saw her to the door, and added in a whisper, so that her son should not hear, "'Wish me good luck.' "'Are you going to see Count Cyril Vladimirovich, my dear?' said the count, coming from the dining-hall into his anteroom. And he added, "'If he is better, ask Pierre to dine with us. He has been to the house, you know, and has danced with the children. Be sure to invite him, my dear. We will see how Taras distinguishes himself to-day. He says Count Orlov never gave such a dinner as ours will be.' So ends chapter 14.